Greetings from New Zealand. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak on this occasion. My only regret is that I cannot be there with you in person. However, I am testing this relatively new technology so that at least you can hear me talking about Cook and not have someone else reading my notes. It seems very appropriate that Newfoundland is hosting a symposium on Cook, given that his time on the island was hugely pivotal in his development and led directly to the later career for which he is now famous. Sadly, many Canadians are largely unaware of Cook's contributions to their history, so it is to be hoped that this symposium will go somewhere to remedy that. It takes very little encouragement for me to talk about Cook, and I am very pleased to use this opportunity to talk about him as a map maker. In my opinion, the production of charts became Cook's raison d'etre, and Newfoundland was where he honed his skills. When James Cook entered the Pacific Ocean in January 1769, he was a skilled seaman with nearly 20 years' experience in the merchant and royal navies behind him. He had acquired high competence in seamanship and navigation, to which he had added a supreme ability to conduct surveys and produce sea charts. He had only been surveying and charting for 10 years, but in that time he had become expertly proficient in these air arts. The opportunity, therefore, of sailing to the Pacific could not have been offered to a more suitable or more grateful officer. Cook's instructions at departure were first to observe an expected transit of Venus and then to search for Terra Australis. But Cook's own private motivation, I believe, was the opportunity to compile new charts. So, when Cook sailed to the Pacific, the production of a new chart was his principal uh, motive. He then set himself very high standards so that any chart he would draw would be of the highest quality and such that he would not have reason to repeat or modify it at a later time. His charts were aimed at fellow seamen, so he incorporated as much information as possible while employing an economy of style and little elaboration. Engravers and other cartographers could embellish his charts later, but Cook rarely added cartouches and certainly never included cherubs or whales. The quality of his charts can be confirmed by the fact that some from Newfoundland and New Zealand could still be safely used over 100 years later. His last piece of the New Zealand hydrographic chart was only removed in the 1990s. The chart on the screen at the moment is one of his earliest, from 19, uh, 1763 or 1764, and it's of Chateau Bay on the Labrador coast. You can see that in the top right it incorporates sailing directions. My copy here is reproduced from Lysart's book on Joseph Banks in Newfoundland, which is well worth investigating. In 1757, Cook passed the examination to become a master on ships of the line in the Royal Navy. Later that year, he was appointed to HMS Pembroke, and in 1758, Together they sailed to Halifax, Nova Scotia, to take part in the siege of Louisbourg on Cape Breton Island. Cook, as master of the Pembroke, was the senior non-commissioned officer, responsible for over 400 men and the day-to-day -day running of the ship. But among his other responsibilities, according to the Admiralty regulations and instructions, a master was expected to record new coasts visited by producing charts, sailing directions, and drawing coastal views. Uh, the regulations, for example, number seven states, he is to apply himself to observe the appearances of coasts and how they show themselves in different points of view, and if he discovers any new shoals or rocks underwater, to note them down in his journal with their bearings and depth of water. So he was producing charts, he was writing sailing directions, and he was drawing coastal views. And Cook embraced all of these activities. Uh, I've jumped ahead with this image. This is Cook's chart of Tahiti. 
uh, from the first voyage done in 1769. Uh, the main island of Tahiti is shown extremely well. Um, it's a wonderful piece of surveying and, and cartography. Uh, it was done by traditional serving me me method in that he walked around the island or rowed parts of it in a rowboat um, to take all the information. In the top left-hand corner is the island of Morea, which is totally unrecognizable to a modern chart. Um, this is perhaps explained by the fact that Cook never visited that island. Quite why he recorded it in this way, I'm not sure. The British successfully dislodged the French from Louisbourg in 1758, and in the few days after the siege had finished, uh, Cook learned to conduct surveys. Uh, he had a very fortuitous meeting with a man called Samuel Holland, who was a Dutch engineer serving in the British Army with, under James Wolfe. The French defenders uh, had just surrendered, and Wolfe had given Holland the task of charting the, the fort and the area around it. And he was down on the beach at Gabarus Bay, which is uh, in the sort of left bottom left-hand corner of the chart, as you see on the screen. And Holland was using a plane table on, a be on the beach when Cook observed him at work. Cook approached Holland and asked to be shown how to use the equipment and how to do the work. Holland agreed, and Cook proved a quick and able learner. It was very fortuitous for Cook that the captain of the Pembroke was a man called John Simcoe, who was very sympathetic to uh, learning and encouraged Cook and other officers in learning to become surveyors. Um, Simcoe, in fact, was one of the f many line of benefactors who recognized qualities in Cook and helped further his career. The chart on the screen is part of Holland's uh, map of Louisbourg that he compiled just after the siege. At this time, there was another surveyor working in um, northern, northeastern America, and this man was called Joseph de Barre. And he produced this delightful little drawing of a surveyor with his surveying party nearby in a rowboat while he uses a plane table to take bearings. Um, I include this because I can imagine it being of Cook. It was done at exactly the same time, and it was done in Canso in Nova Scotia. So same time, virtually the same place. Um, as I say, to my mind, a beautiful little watercolor of the work that was being take, undertaken. Later in 1758, Wolfe dispatched, uh, was dispatched to Gaspé at the mouth of the St. Lawrence with a, a group of ships to, uh, to tidy up the French that were inhabiting that area. While this was happening, Cook produced his first own chart that we know of. This was done in late 1758, as I say, and it was published later in London. Um, how it was published remains a little bit of a mystery. I expect that jo John Simcoe, the captain, arranged for this chart to be published, as I don't believe Cook had either the finances or the contacts for it to, uh, to be undertaken. So as I say, I think John Simcoe arranged for it to be done. It later appeared complete with um, elaborate cartouches and things, and was dedicated to the Trinity Brethren, the body that examined the ship's masters. So I think it was probably Cook thanking the, uh, the Trinity Brethren for passing him to become a master. Cook's next challenge was to be part of the expedition that went to Quebec in 1759 to uh, lay siege to that city. In anticipation of this, Cook and Holland uh, worked together to produce a chart of the St. Lawrence. Um, they used partly captured French charts, but as the 
British expedition went up the St. Lawrence, Cook was also surveying as he went. Cook played a very significant role in the whole uh, campaign to attack Quebec. The head of the British fleet in this campaign was Admiral Charles Saunders, and he arranged for the chart that Cook and Holland produced to be published in London, together with detailed sailing directions. The chart is shown here on the screen, or at least part of it is the area of Ile d'Orléans, and it shows also in the right-hand side the traverse, which the French didn't bother to protect, thinking that the British wouldn't be able to sail through it. But Cook and some other surveyors in rowboats went ahead and found a channel and charted it and set it out with buoys, which enabled the British fleet to get past and lay siege to Quebec. I also include here a, a very naive sketch by a sailor called Ashley Bowen. Uh, he was from Massachusetts, and he sailed with Cook on the 1759 campaign, and this is one of the very, very, very few illustrations of the Pembroke, and it shows it at Quebec in 1759. As I said earlier, um, Cook was not in a position financially to have his chart uh, published. And in fact, officers of the time were expected to pay for their charts to be published. There was no central authority doing this, and the Admiralty didn't pay for it. So Cook was once again relying on the generosity of senior officers, in this occasion Charles Saunders. It would only be in 1793 that Britain established a hydrographic office to coordinate the production, publication, and dissemination of charts. And uh, on the screen at the moment is one of Cook's charts, and you'll recognize it of being the south coast of your island. And this is one of the, the wonderful pieces of work that Cook produced in the few years that he was based there. Uh, up until this time, this part of the coast was very poorly known and recorded on charts. So what Cook did here is, is quite magnificent. Cook determined to produce the best quality charts possible and expected others to do the same. His charts were very much working documents intended to be used by other seamen. And as I said earlier, he rarely spent in t time producing or introducing elaborate cartouches and filling empty spaces with whales or other figures. Instead, he would fill spaces with more detailed charts of harbours or other important features. For example, his chart of the northern peninsula and strait of Belle Isle in Newfoundland has five such detailed inserts. The chart on the screen at present is one of Dusky Sound in South Island, New Zealand, and it was done by Joseph Gilbert, who was master of the resolution during the second voyage. And Gilbert should be known more in your part of the world because he had earlier charted the Bay of Islands in Newfoundland and parts of the Labr Labrador coast. In fact, there is, I think, to this day, still a, a Gilbert River up there. The small inset on the right of the screen is of Pickersgill Harbour in Dusky Sound. And this remained on hydrographic charts until very recently. And after the siege of Quebec in 1759, Cook transferred to become master of HMS Northumberland under Commodore Alexander Lord Colville. They were based at Halifax, Nova Scotia, for over two years, and this allowed Cook plenty of opportunity to hone his skills further. Therefore, in August 1762, when Cook was part of a flotilla sent to recapture Newfoundland from the French, he was able to compile accurate charts of many of the harbours around the Avalon Peninsula. Colville wrote letters to the Admiralty praising Cook's charts, and Cook's reputation was quickly recognised by Thomas Graves, the governor of Newfoundland. Graves had realised the poor quality of charts of the island, and in 1763, he made representations to the British government that a surveyor be immediately appointed to remedy the situation, to conduct a careful survey of the long and intricate coastline. 
and it's most probable that he always had Cook in mind and Cook was soon appointed to the role. Therefore, Cook returned to Newfoundland in 1763 and began a procedure that he would repeat over several years. As the climate of the island closed, down, closed it down for several months over the winter, Cook followed the routine adopted by European fishermen who crossed the Atlantic to fish the Grand Banks. He sailed to Newfoundland in the spring, worked hard over the summer months before crossing back to Britain late in the year, where during the winter months he produced fair copies from the rough charts he had compiled during the summer. Hugh Palliser, who had replaced Graves as Newfoundland's governor in 1764, uh, had already been Cook's captain from 1755 to 1757 on HMS Eagle. The two men now formed a working partnership that developed into a close friendship, uh, and Palliser went on to be a principal supporter uh, for Cook's appointment to the Endeavour in 1768. But by 1768, Cook had produced an incredible portfolio of charts, sailing directions and other material detailing about two-thirds of the Newfoundland coast. Cook arranged for jo Thomas Jeffries, a London map seller, to publish his charts, and they continued to be incorporated in other publications for many years. On the screen now are two charts that highlight the difference Cook made. The left-hand one, from 1764, incorporates, sorry, the, the left-hand one from 1764 has a little bit of Cook's work in the northern peninsula, but the south part of the island is very poorly recorded. The right-hand chart from, is from much uh, a little bit later and incorporates the work of Cook, Michael Lane, Gilbert, who I mentioned before, Cartwright, and by now it already represents the geography of the island far more correctly. The south coast especially is now shown properly. As I've said, Cook was expected to produce sailing directions, and this he did superbly. And this illustration shows the title pages for two of the works that he did for Newfoundland, uh, for which he had to pay as I've said earlier, the publishing costs. Cook took incredible care to depict death, depths close to shore. The rocks, including those not even showing at uh, low tide, at high tide, sorry, are also shown in, in great detail. And these are parts of two of Cook's own charts. The left-hand one is Halifax Harbour, and the right-hand one is Codroy. The third part of uh, the expectation that Cook produced were coastal views, and these, would ha I would have to say, are his least successful. Um, the top one is a coastal view by James Cook, taken from his log when he was on HMS Eagle in 1756. Uh, it shows part of the northern coast of Brittany, um, the settlement of Morlaix, and, to put it bluntly, it's not very good, very naive. The lower illustration is a better example. These were done in 1762 as the British, I won't call it a fleet, because there were only about three vessels headed to Placentia to uh, take back the island from the French. Um, and these are of the Burin Peninsula. By the time Cook went to the Pacific, he was lucky that on the first voyage he had um, artists, and one of them was Herman Spurring, and this is uh, one of his coastal views, and it's Motuara Island in Queen Charlotte Sound, South Island, New Zealand. And this is a beautiful little pen and ink and water, uh, watercolor and you can go and sit in Ship's Cove, uh, where the, the Endeavour was birthed, and look out across to this island, and it just looks like this um, today. The method that Cook used for surveying the island was that 
He entrusted the care of the Grenville, the schooner, later brig, that he used to his master's mate, to begin with William Parker, later Michael Lane, and they would operate just slightly offshore, taking soundings in the open water, that sort of thing. In the meantime, Cook, with a small boat, would maneuver around inshore, recording the depths around the coast, and going ashore and using land-based uh, trigonometry surveying to, uh, to get the baselines and to, uh, to form the basis of the, the survey that he was producing. And this is part of one of his charts um, around Farol in the northern part of Newfoundland. And you can still see the, the triangulations that he uh, worked on, as well as all the, the depths recordings that he produced, and the extra information that he produced, such as fishing stages, the, the strange... Uh, tees that you can see around the harbour are fishing stages. So he was recording lots of information as well as producing the survey. Then, as I say, he would combine the information that he produced on land and inshore with the information that Parker and Lane and other people produced offshore to produce the charts that uh, we have today. Given um, the lack of or is the, the quality of the equipment that he had at his disposal and the conditions that he had to work under, the, uh, the quality of his charts is quite fantastic. This is a, a famous chart that Cook produced of New Zealand um, after the first voyage, and it is immediately recognizable as New Zealand, but you will see that it is very basic. It is the the outline of the islands, it records there the route that they took, there are some soundings, that sort of thing, and you get a title. Hardly any elaboration or decoration. Cook was producing these charts for other seamen, and he left it to the cartographers back in Europe to produce the elaborations. These are two Italian versions of Cook's chart of New Zealand, and in a way, a lot more attractive, beautiful cartouches, etc. But uh, basically, the map is still Cook's. I mentioned earlier about how he would didn't like empty spaces, and this is his chart, or part of one of his charts, of the Northern Peninsula and the coast of Labrador. And you will see that he has many inset maps showing in greater detail harbors and other interested, interesting things that he felt other seamen would need to be aware of. Cook was fortunate that at the time he was working, British scientific instrument work makers were leading the world in the development of new instruments and the improvement of existing ones. Cook was prepared to use these new instruments, but only if he could see that they offered sufficient advantages. For example, he carried early trial versions of the marine chronometer in his Pacific voyages and was only gradually won over to them. He remained loyal to the lunar distance method of calculating longitude well into, I think, the second voyage at least. Among the craftsmen working in London at the time were John Bird, Jesse Ramsden, Jonathan Sissons, James Short and John Dolland. Um, existing instruments included compasses, telescopes, backstaffs, astrolabes, octants, and quadrants. Tele telescopes, both reflecting and refracting, were improved dramatically during the mid-18th century, especially by Short and Dolland, while Sissons developed theodolites. Cook used examples of their work in the Pacific. John Bird, working with John Campbell, a naval captain, adapted the quadrant by adding a telescope sight and giving it a greater arc, one-sixth of a circle, hence sextant, which allowed far more precise determination of latitude. Uh, Cook used early versions of these. Uh, it was all very well to have people making these new developments in instruments, but it needed people capable of using them, and I believe that Cook was very good at that. Latitude, because of the sextant, 
by the time of Cook was sailing to the Pacific was quite easy to calculate and quite um, correct. Longitude remained far more difficult. As I said, Cook used the lunar distance method, uh, and this required long calculations each time using tables produced in Germany in 1753 by Tobias Meyer, a German mathematician. Mind, while this was happening, though, John Harrison was developing the marine chronometer, and by the second and third voyages, Cook was carrying his equipment, and they enabled him to record his position more quickly and correctly. And by the time of the third voyage, even the longitudes was now becoming very correct. Cook revisited several locations in the Pacific, for example, Matavai Bay in Tahiti and Queen Charlotte Sound in New Zealand were favorite locations, and he returned on both the second and third voyages. However, he never wasted time or effort making new versions of existing charts, but concentrated on preparing charts of newly visited locations. So, for example, on the second voyage, the only place that really got uh, a new chart, a chart was Dusky Sound, down in Fiordland in the southwest corner of the islands. But the new instruments carried on board allowed him to refine and correct the coordinates of his anchorages. And this table shows that the determination of latitude was already relatively easy and a precise process. However, great strides were being made in calculating longitude, and the table shows how, if you compare the Queen Charlotte sound recordings, the accuracy improved over the three voyages. The earlier figures were derived by Cook using lunar tables, but by the third voyage, the more, more correct figures were obtained using the chronometers. His coordinates for Queen Charlotte Sound were only out by five seconds in latitude and six and a half minutes in longitude, which is a quite remarkable achievement for the time. When you're compiling new charts of new places, you have the opportunity to, for ascribing new place names. Cook, for some reason, seems rather reluctant to do this uh, in his early travels. Uh, for example, there is little direct evidence that he named many features in Newfoundland. Most features on that island already possessed names, and Cook learned most of them from local fishermen that he used as pilots. Cook's harbour on the northern peninsula may be a rare occasion where he actually named something after himself, though I'm not certain of that. It may have already been an existing name. When he transferred to the Pacific, he still had little confidence and realised the need to please his masters of the Admiralty and other dignitaries back in Britain by honouring them by using their, their names. So, for example, Philip Stevens and Hugh Palliser from the Admiralty, both had several features named after them in Australia and New Zealand. Only a few members of his crew had features named after them. But interestingly, at no time did Cook name anything after members of his own family. That Cook used few local names in the Pacific and Australia, and instead imposed British names, also reflects the limited contact he often had with the indigenous peoples, and associated problems of communication with them. For example, Cook's chart of the east coast of Australia has a string of British but no Aboriginal names. Where better understanding occurred, such as at Tahiti or in New Zealand, more local names appeared on the charts. The map on the screen at the moment is Cook's chart of Cook Strait in New Zealand, and it is one of the very few places that we know where Cook used his own name. But even here, he was persuaded to do so by Joseph Banks, who was traveling on the Endeavour voyage. Just as John Simcoe had encouraged him back in 1758 in uh, Cape Breton, Cook realized the need to train others. His young gentlemen, the midshipmen and master's mates on board his ships, were shown how to survey, and he used them to copy charts, thereby learning the art of cartography. Um, during the later voyages, Cook gradually delegated the survey work and cartography to his crew. Uh, he took a back seat as he became more the captain of the vessel, and he realized that he had very able people 
sailing with him that could carry out this work. Several of the men under him went on to become explorer cartographers in their own right. Uh, James Colnett, Nathaniel Portlock and George Dixon all led expeditions and produced new charts. Other people would be, of course, William Bly of Bounty Notoriety. The chart on the screen is done by Isaac Smith, who was the cousin of Cook's wife, and it shows Botany Bay in New South Wales. Of Cook's protégés, probably by the one who uh, emulated him the most, uh, his best protégé, was George Vancouver, who in the 1790s led an expedition to the northwest coast of North America and charted from Cook Inlet in the north right down to the Mexican coast in the south. It is equal in quality to Cook at his best. It represents one of the most marvelous expeditions of surveying and cartography ever. So, Cook unfortunately died at Keala Kuku Bay in February 1779. His work unfinished in a lot of ways, but the chart that was produced after the third voyage, this is drawn by Henry Roberts, shows the Pacific very much as we know it today. So that in fact, I think that the chart of the Pacific uh, is the best legacy that we have from Cook, the best testament to the skill that he had in surveying and, and marine charting. Examples of Cook's charts have been re reproduced in various places. If, if you want to see the originals, you basically have to go to Britain, to National Archives at Kew. I think some are still, a few are still left at Taunton at the Hydrographic Office, but most of them now have found their way to Kew. But as I say, many have been reproduced, and Cook's Newfoundland charts were brought together by Skelton and published in 1965. Copies of all the charts of the Pacific voyages were, were assembled in three volumes edited by Andrew David. And Andrew David is one of these people that uh, needs to be commended for his huge contribution to the uh, study of Cook and what he achieved. Um, those specific charts were published by the Hacklute Society. And the Skelton and David volumes highlight Cook's consummate skill as a surveyor cartographer. After he left the Pacific, it really left little for others following him to add. Uh, one of the few explorers to rival Cook was Jean-Francois de Gallup de la Perouse, who wrote of Cook in his journal when off Maui in Hawaii in May 1786. I am full of admiration and respect for the memory of this great man. I shall always regard him as the first among navigators and the one who determined the precise situation of these islands, who surveyed their coastline. But only men of his caliber leave nothing further to be known about the countries they have seen. Certainly every navigator owes him a tribute of praise. Thank you very much.